Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, we're so glad to have so many of you here today with us for Safe Church Ministries monthly webinar. And so uh, we are glad to have Jay Stringer with us today, the author of Unwanted, and uh, I'll introduce him a little bit more. But first, we wanted to introduce some of the staff members of Safe Church Ministry. And so my name is Eric Koss. I am an associate with Safe Church, and I've been working with Safe Church for um, it's about three and a half years. And so it's good to be here with you today. Okay. All right. I'm Jane DeGroot, and I'm um, so happy to see you all here this afternoon. It's an exciting interview. Um, and I'm the coordinator for Classes Muskegon, which is just west of Grand Rapids for Safe Church Ministry. I've been doing that for about three years now. I'm Becky. It's really nice to meet, meet you. Um, I'm the volunteer and communication specialist for Safe Church. Thank you. And I'm Bonnie Nicholas. I'm the director of Safe Church um, for a little while longer, till November. And in case people are unfamiliar with Safe Church, I just want to say a few words from our sponsor. Uh, Safe Church Ministry equips congregations in abuse awareness, prevention, and response. And we just long for the day when our church communities are places where each person is valued and respected and protected. And abuse is unthinkable. So that's what we're working toward. We're working toward communities wherever abuse occurs, the church responds with compassion and justice that fosters healing. So um, until that time, we're just continuing to bring this work forward and we're thankful that you are here today, thanks. And again, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a pretty laid back webinar together. We have the incredible honor to, uh, to host Jay Stringer as, a, as our guest speaker. And um, I just want to read a, a brief introduction of who Jay is. And after that, we're going to go into some interview questions that both Jane and I developed and have a conversation. And then we also welcome you to share some questions you might have or comments. Um, and you can put those in the chat feature of Zoom. And then after maybe a half hour or so. Um, and so we'd like to welcome Jay. And uh, Jay is a licensed mental health counselor. He's also a Christian Reformed Church ordained minister and an internationally requested speaker on the subject of unwanted sexual behavior. Jay's award-winning first book, which is right here, I have it backwards. It's a cool back cover though, like, very interesting. Um, it, his uh, first book, uh, Unwanted, How Sexual Brokenness Reveals Our Way to Healing, is based on a multi-year research project into the stories of 3,800 men and women. Um, Unwanted also explores the key drivers of unwanted sexual behavior, why people stay in self-destructive patterns, and how to disempower shame. His research is one of the most comprehensive studies on the subject and Unwanted is being used currently by counselors, churches, and small groups throughout the world. Jay also collaborated with the Heart of Man film, to, the film team to design an online course called The Journey Course for individuals, accountability partners, and small groups who desire freedom from unwanted sexual behavior. We strongly recommend this helpful tool um, to journey deeper into the narratives of your life and um, that may be, as Jay says, the key drivers of unwanted sexual behavior. And so we're so glad to have Jay here with us today. Um, and to start, Jane will um, ask a few questions. Yes. Well, I want you to know this is my first real interview on Zoom with a celebrity. And uh, I, I overcame my fear because I just was so taken by your book, Jay. And it meant so much to me at a time that I really needed it. And I won't go into my story, but um, it, it came at a good time for me to understand this whole concept of unwanted sexual behavior from um, people that I was listening to as the coordinator for Class Egan. And um, so I just um, love the, the research and, and your narrative. I, I like the way you articulate some really tough issues. Um, 
I was convinced as a classes leader that we should have this available as a resource and a reference book. So we bought and circulated at least two dozen copies in the area to individuals and to ver various churches. Um, I could go on about that, but let it suffice to say that it has been extremely well received. So to kick it off here, I'd like you, Jay, to just tell us a bit about yourself as much as you want to and um, your own story and then what led you to write this book, Unwanted, and then create the journey course. Thank you, Jane. Uh, and first off, it's just, it's good to see you all. There's a lot of faces uh, that I recognize, and I, I know I do it, but we all look at each other's backgrounds, uh, and I, I definitely see Doug's background. We just moved from uh, Seattle, Pacific Northwest, to New York City, and so looking at Doug's background, I am aching and lamenting for <laughs> Pacific Northwest geography. So, uh, it, yeah, thank you uh, to Safe Church, to Bonnie, Becky, Eric for just hosting this conversation. Uh, so grateful that you all are uh, just willing to address uh, this issue. It's uh, so important. So uh, in terms of writing Unwanted, I think part of where I would begin is just uh, to say that I was a pastor's kid. My dad was a Presbyterian PCA minister. And so growing up, uh, as many of you all know, uh, when people go through a type of crisis, uh, they will often try and reach the pastor at the church. If they can't reach the pastor there, uh, they will then uh, call the pastor at home. This was pre-cell phone days. And so uh, I have one really distinct memory of uh, an elder's wife calling us at dinner time, and she left a message that essentially said, uh, you know, my husband, the elder in this church, uh, just had, a, I just found out that he's been having an affair for the last eight months. Uh, and I just remember watching my dad go into crisis mode, uh, my mom go into crisis mode. Uh, and through the years, just hearing answering machine messages from people who were uh, going through mental health crises, uh, suicidality. And I remember being, in many ways, a young boy wondering, why is it that so many people are so much more honest in their crisis and in, in the middle of the week than they can actually be on Sunday? Uh, and so that was kind of a really formative place of, you know, the, the truth is so often told Monday through Saturday, not on Sunday. Why is that? Uh, and so fast forward, uh, skipping over a lot of my story, but I ended up in the Seattle, Washington area and the church plant that I was a part of got invited by the mayor of Seattle to run what was called the John School. And so I was asked to come in to talk about the neighborhood impact of John's. Uh, I have both my MDiv and a master's in counseling psychology. So I started talking a little bit to these men just about uh, some of the key drivers that might be bringing them to buy sex. And one of these um, John School participants actually became my client. And what he told me was this. He said, Jay, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, I am definitely compulsively buying sex and I, I do it for the sex. But he said, the, the most significant thing for me is actually when I get in my SUV and I start cruising around the neighborhoods of Seattle and I try and lock eyes with women on the streets. And he said, that's why I go out doing this stuff. Uh, and so we, we dove in a little bit into his story, began to process that theme of kind of cruising around the streets and locking eyes. And what he told me was that when he was in middle school, he got a Schwinn bicycle. And he said, Jay, I loved that bike. And I said, you know, why did you love that bike? And he said, well, uh, my mom was a single mom. And so she would work two jobs. And I used to get on that Schwinn and just cruise around the neighborhood, trying to lock eyes with girls in my classes and, their, and my friend's moms. And so unbeknownst to him, part of the language that he was using for cruising around the streets of Seattle in an SUV was actually the same language that he was beginning to use with regard to being a middle school student trying to find a sense of connection in the world. And so that's what I started seeing from just a pattern recognition standpoint of 
there are so many unprocessed stories that people are not attending to, and then it's showing up in their sexual brokenness. And so just reading, uh, I would say a lot of the Christian literature out there on sexual brokenness, um, I don't wanna use too much of a derogatory description, but I would just say uh, it, it's a lot of it is crap. Uh, and when you begin to really ask some of the questions of, you know, why do we do what we do? Most of the way that the Christian framework is given to people is what I would say is just less management. And this is the bounce your eyes when you're having uh, an inappropriate thought, get some internet monitoring on your computer if you keep struggling with going back to porn. Uh, and, you know, just hearing a lot of, you know, messages and poor metaphors from my clients and certainly from my own adolescent days around, uh, you know, if you, if you've ever been impure at any point in your life, which is in many ways, all of us, then in some ways that's no different than like a, a lollipop that you've just to let someone else lick. And so then by the time you actually give that lollipop to someone, when you get married, you're, you know, you're uh, basically degraded. And so a lot of just the, the language that the, the church has used was not actually equipping people to go deeper into their stories to understand what needed to be healed. So I decided to do some research on about 4,000 men and women to get a sense of what was actually driving this. And uh, the long, you know, basically what we found was that sexual brokenness is not random at all. It's a direct reflection of the parts of someone's story that remained unaddressed. And so, uh, when it came down to specific types of pornography searches, infidelity, buying sex, all of those fantasies and behaviors could actually be shaped and predicted based on the parts of someone's story that were not being addressed. And so that led to the decision to write Unwanted and to kind of begin to say, our sexual brokenness is not a life sentence to sexual shame or addiction. It's actually a roadmap to healing. Uh, and so, uh, both from, uh, you know, Jane, to sum up your, uh, the answer to your question, just so much of my own involvement in the church growing up about how we never talked about these things and then work with clients, uh, really just showed me what the, what the real matters of the heart that needed to be attended to in order for people to find healing. Uh, thanks, Jay. That. That's very um, helpful and obviously drove a lot of time and energy from your life, you know, to be able to respond to what you felt was the need um, and is, obviously. Um, I just, I found the book so helpful in just navigating regular relationships, you know, day to day. Uh, relationships, um, and especially from the, um, I think it's the, the middle section, why do I stay? Um, some of those um, paradoxical pairs that you talk about in um, that middle section are, I think, especially helpful in identifying a healthy tension within us. And those are, um, you know, they're, they're really interesting, I think, concepts. Um, the attunement versus containment, conflict versus repair, and strength versus vulnerability. You know, we need, we need some of everything. But I'm just wondering, from your perspective, um, speaking from your own experience, which set would you say is the most challenging for someone who struggles with unwanted sexual behavior and then, and why? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, like you pointed out, Jane, these, those three paradoxical pairs are not, they're not like menu options that you get to pick and choose. We, we actually need all of them. It's one thing with three parts. So I, I would say the most foundational is attunement and containment. And if that, that language isn't familiar to you, that's taken from psychology. And so attunement uh, is basically about, uh, you know, I was hanging out with my niece last night 
and uh, she's two years old, and she uh, was going around the house going, oh, stinky, stinky, stinky. Uh, and as she was doing that, she was just a riot. Um, we were all cracking up, and she would go to each adult in the room just to do that. And so what was she looking for? She was looking for a sense of attunement. And so attunement's chief task is really the, the sense of delight. Uh, so when you grew up, was there a sense of attunement? Did you get a sense that your mom, your dad, your community uh, didn't just put up with you, but they deeply, deeply enjoyed you? Uh, containment is, is much more, uh, you know, it's an issue of honor. Uh, it's an issue of, you know, when you were growing up, were your differences in musical tastes, in fashion, uh, in ideas actually respected? So some people grow up loving C.S. Lewis. Some people are much more drawn towards Nietzsche. Some love Rich Mullins. Some love the Grateful Dead. And so that sense of when you were actually developing your own uniqueness as a child, uh, were those differences honored? Was there a sense of not you can do anything you want to, but at least when we begin to put some containment on curfew or what you can do or what you can listen to, uh, was that held with honor or was it overly rigid? And so what ends up happening is if you were to think about uh, let's just say middle school. And uh, middle school is a prototype of uh, Gehenna <laughs> for so many of us. Uh, we have been through so much heartache during those years. And so when you go through middle school, uh, when you came back after you were bullied or abused, was there a sense of your parents were attuned to be able to say, hey, Jay, when you left this morning, uh, you seemed pleasant, you seemed like your normal self, but when you came home, something of your face shifted. Are you okay? Uh, and so attunement is that sense of, I, I see you, I watch you, I'm concerned for you. Uh, and so what happens within containment is oftentimes in very religious systems, there's a lot of rigidity. Um, and so what ends up happening in the life of someone struggling with sexual brokenness is they learn that their home is not going to be the place where they are attuned with, where they are sought out with delight. And they also realize that very often their home is going to be a very, very rigid place. And so what ends up happening in the life of many people who go on to struggle with sexual brokenness is they realize that if I'm going to find attunement, I might need to find the eyes of someone in pornography. I might need to find the eyes of a hookup type of culture or an affair because I can't trust that my formative relationships are actually going to be places where I'm known. Uh, additionally, when you grow up in a very rigid, overly contained system, what's the response to that? It's going to be a type of anger. Uh, and so as we all know from Matthew 5, what is Jesus talking about with the nature of sin? Well, it's lust and it's anger. And so whenever you're at the confluence of lust and anger, that's what will end up happening with a lot of people who struggle with sexual brokenness is they lust for attunement. And the overly contained world that they've lived in leads them to a type of anger to begin to reject that system. And so, Jane, to answer your question, the the as someone struggling with sexual brokenness deeply goes on to struggle with issues of attunement and containment. So they continue to outsource that attunement to an affair. They continue to outsource that attunement to the world of pornography, to buying sex. And they don't know how to contain really difficult emotions. So Right? So some of you are pastors, some of you are leaders. Well, what do you do in the midst of crisis? What do you do in the midst of your spouse rejecting intimacy with you? If you don't know how to contain and honor those differences, what's going to end up happening to a lot of people is that they begin to try and find a surrogate form of freedom and revenge in their sexual life. And so, you know, part of the, the task of repentance for these 
men and women is to begin to look at how do I begin to attune more to my own vulnerability, to my own sadness, to my own grief and anger. And if I can move towards myself with kindness for what I'm in, that's really where I will begin to change. And I think that's the language of Romans 2.4. Do you not know that it is the kindness of God that leads to change? Most of the people that we work with will try to change principally out of self-contempt of, I hate my sin, I don't want to do this anymore, I hate myself, look at how flawed or broken or disgusting I am. And so they try to change through willpower, through might, through lust management, but it's really that sense of, do they see uh, part of the crisis, the, the difficulty, the sadness of what they're in right now? And do they offer attunement to themselves and offer an ability to contain some of the anger, some of the sorrow within them? Well, that makes so much sense, Jay. Um, I, I questioned myself, why am I asking this question? But in hearing your answer, I, I get it. I get it. It really, it's so critical to our wholeness in, in our spiritual, but also our physical lives and emotional makeup. So thank you for that. Turning it over to Eric. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. And um, I've appreciated all of your work, the research and the way that you've um, especially put this book into the three different parts. Um, how, did you, how did you get here to begin? And then why do I stay? And then uh, how, do, how, how do I get out of here? And um, I specifically like the first part where you do go into the family of origin and you do just a lot of connections between uh, current sexual brokenness and behaviors there uh, into the, the ways that we, we, we grew up and the way we were formed. And I know for me, when I went through seminary, my pastoral care class was just pivotal for me. Un understanding my genogram, understanding the shame that is inherent in, in the different people within my, my family and how that shame was manifested and um, what the relationship was like to their siblings and their parents. Um, and then when I, uh, when I connect it to different levels of sexual brokenness, um, so many more things make sense. Um, so I, I'm just wondering a little bit more about um, the power that you've been able to um, speak and, and what feedback you've gotten in regards to specifically the, the how, how I got here and um, re relating the different behaviors to um, up, an, an upbringing somebody experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, you know, the three portions of the book are, as you said, they're, they're all questions. And, uh, you know, being trained theologically, that, that's no accident. So a lot of what I have just loved uh, with regard to the scriptures is that whenever God shows up, particularly in the Old Testament, in the midst of difficult situations, uh, God asks Questions. So to Adam, who's just uh, eaten of the tree that he was commanded not to eat from, uh, the, God shows up and says, where are you? Uh, and then one great example is just the, the story of Hagar, uh, you know, traumatized uh, Egyptian teenager who's just been assaulted at the hands of the first family of our faith. Well, she leaves the first family of our faith and goes out into the wilderness by where all accounts she's going to die. So it's a spring on the road to Shur, which sounds like the Four Seasons, but it's much more like a truck stop on I-95 or I-10, uh, not the place that you want to end up. And so what, what does the angel of the Lord ask her? Uh, says, Hagar, where do you come from and where are you going? And so if we are hearing the voice of God with regard to our sexual struggles, uh, is it one of curiosity? And I think that that's what God is doing is to being able to say, Jay, uh, Sandy, Ben, uh, Laura, it, there is sexual brokenness in your life. Uh, where do you come from? Where is it that you want to go? And so I think really, really, uh, central dimension to healing is to begin to study the path that got us there. And so one of the things that my research looked at was uh, some of the major porn sites throughout the world actually published their top 20 search for findings. 
uh, in terms of what people are actually Googling. So I took those top 20 search for terms and then began to ask people what their stories were with their mothers, with their fathers, formative events like sexual abuse, bullying, abandonment, uh, and basically wanted to see, could someone's sexual fantasy and behaviors actually be predicted uh, based on their family of origin. And what we found was that, yes, it can be. So an example of this would be, if you were a man struggling with uh, seeking out pornography that involved the race that suggested to you some level of subservience, uh, maybe you wanted to see someone uh, that was blonde or more of a petite body type, what we learned was that that story could be shaped and predicted by you had a very strict father you had high levels of shame and you had a lot of difficulty with purpose in your present day life. And so, you know, to me, as I hear that, you know, as a therapist pastor, it's, it's that sense of, well, where are we right now in the text? We're in Genesis three. Uh, you know, what is the curse for a man? It's, it's a sense of futility. So if this man is dealing with a lot of futility in his life um, and has had a father that has been very strict and has overpowered him, well, guess what he's doing in his sexual fantasy life? He's creating a world without thorns and thistles. He's creating a world where it's not by the sweat of his brow will he have to earn a living. It's that he can get anything he wants to right now. And so I, I think as we begin to ask questions of, you know, to people, who introduced you to pornography? Uh, what was your first sexual experience as a boy or a girl? Was it something that you actually chose? Or was someone, even if it was a peer, did they begin to introduce you to porn or to sexual uh, touch? And so what we found was that the highest users of pornography had sexual abuse scores in their childhood that were nearly 24% higher than those who did not view pornography at all. And so what that brings us into is that many of us, if our first sexual experience was one of abuse, if our first sexual experience was one of pornography, well, that sets a sexual template that if those things are not healed or addressed, will go on to play itself out over a lifetime. And so I think really central to anybody trying to find healing from sexual brokenness has to be a sense of, yes, this is an issue of sexual integrity and sexual sin, but we also have to go back to the places where you were sinned against. Because the reality is, is there, there is no sin that I can commit past, present, or future that has not already been atoned in the life death and resurrection of Jesus. So therefore, the issue is not about is my sin forgiven, but far more, where am I finding comfort for the, the wounds of my past? And again, where are we? We're in Matthew 5, 4. Do you not know that is the kind, or where, uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so I think that's part of the invitation for healing is uh, what stories in your life have you not mourned uh, with regard to your sexual life? And if you haven't mourned those, well, you're going to keep finding surrogate places of comfort in your sexual life. So that, that's the, how did I get here? Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, you know, as I've been reflecting on your book, and I don't want to turn this into a counseling session, but I, I remember two <laughs> memories that are just so vital to, um, to my, also my um, belief in Christ. And uh, well, the first one was, you know, just about printing off pornography when I was like 12 or 11. And um, I didn't know that something was messed up with the computer, but um, I turned off the computer the next night, somebody else turned on the computer. And it, you know, it took a long time for computers to turn on the, uh, back in the day, yeah. but then the printer just started and out comes these pornographic images. And then one of my siblings was like, what is this? Who printed this? And, uh, hmm. I instantly see it and I just shame just covers me. I just, I just start crying and my mom and dad, um, they laughed you know, in that moment. And, and I, I just ran, I just ran. And um, I didn't hear about that again, you know, and it was just um, cut off at that moment. And then um, fast forward a couple of years later, I, I still, you know, had recurring issues with, with pornography. And 
um, remember as a youth group setting, a worship um, time, and we were invited to share what was separating us from God. And I was sitting there just shaken with my shame and my guilt. And I felt myself get up to move to the middle of the circle to share this, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't share it. And instead I said that I wasn't there for my family when they needed me. That's what, it, those were the words that I said in the middle of that. And I, I just bawled and I didn't realize what was taking place, but I, I think different levels of shame, um, different narratives that were put on me and different levels of support, you know, were, were coming out in that moment. And um, I still to this day sense that um, Christ just taking me in that moment and just saying, you're my son in whom I am well pleased. And um, yeah, and, and, and I think that w that was a powerful moment. I've continued to unpack it and unpack, you know, my family of origin. Um, and your, your book has helped me do that. And so um, I just mentioned that to, to just say that this, this has been helpful in my life as well. So. so good. Yeah, and just that, I mean, that issue of silence is so significant. I mean, the, whether it was laughter or just that sense of if you, you know, if you have never heard someone talk about sex, uh, have never heard someone talk about certain things, how are you as a kid supposed to be able to have language for these things? So my research also looked at, you know, did, did people that were struggling with sexual brokenness actually have a helpful conversation with their mothers and fathers? And overwhelmingly, the answer was no. Uh, and so, you know, wherever there is shame, uh, you're going to see an increased amount of sexual brokenness. Uh, why? Because contrary to popular belief, we don't go to pornography, infidelity, uh, to self-medicate. We actually go to those behaviors to actually reinforce our core shame. And so if I feel ashamed of my sexual brokenness, well, guess what I'm going to keep seeking out? well, more and more evidence of judgment against myself. So that's why, I mean, just to your point, we need to equip mothers and fathers. We need to equip churches uh, to be able to handle some of those moments of it's not if porn shows up in the life of a child, it's, it's when it shows up. It's not is pornography going to be part of your marriage, but far more, do you realize that marriage will intensify and amplify every sexual struggle that both spouses have coming into it. And so if we are not in the front lines of talking, you know, there's no awkwardness in the scriptures about sex, that, that's a church thing. Uh, and so that sense of how do we begin to talk openly about the world of the internet, the world of sexual abuse, sexual assault. I mean, just the reality of, you know, one in three women uh, are going to experience a sexual assault before the age of 18. Uh, and we're not equipping churches, parents for those statistics. What in the world? Yes, absolutely. Um, I just want to give a quick pitch. If um, any of you have heard of Over 18, it's a screening that's been produced, um, which documents uh, just the epidemic of, of porn, specifically in, in kids, uh, kids' usage of it. And Jane has actually shown this in her church and in, in classes Muskegon. And we've had a variety of other classes who's shown it as well. And Circle of Grace also is a really helpful program for churches where uh, adults and children are both learning uh, together. And, um, you know, I found that adults aren't feeling comfortable with, with this, but then once they have to teach the curriculum, they, they learn how to talk about it in an age appropriate way. And so if you haven't heard of those two resources, we encourage you to check those out. And um, Jay, I'm wondering if you could give, uh, or what encouraging word could you give to people who are struggling with this, who may be watching today? Uh, I think we have to come back to this notion that, that God is not ashamed or surprised of our sexual brokenness. Uh, but actually understands our brokenness to be the, the very geography where we come to understand something of the goodness of God. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as we look at almost every difficult thing that we are cornered with, whether it's a job, whether it's a marriage, whether it's our own sexual brokenness, problems are how we grow. Uh, it's how we grow spiritually. It's how we grow emotionally. And so just that language of, you know, Romans 12, 2, 
don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, you can't actually renew your sexual mind if you don't have a context to begin to process it. And so I think that's where I always come back to just the role of curiosity, of being able to invite people to consider this notion that uh, you may not know what your sexual brokenness reveals. You know, at the height of anyone's sexual brokenness, it's that feeling as you described well, Eric, like I'm shaking, I don't wanna reveal this, um, but it's actually in revealing our heartache and our brokenness where we come to actually understand something of God's commitment to us. Uh, and so I think just to be able to kind of say, yes, we, we've been in a war with shame. When you look at the role of evil, what does evil do? It comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so just that sense of, you know, your sexual brokenness, as my friend Julie Slattery says, is not, you know, something to wage war on. This is a territory to be reclaimed. Uh, and so as we begin to really grapple with, uh, yeah, there, there's some formative reasons why we struggle with sexual brokenness, but the more that we pay attention to our fantasy life, to, to the, the stories that informed why we struggle, the more that we're actually going to find growth. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can also share uh, an encouragement for people who are walking alongside others who may be struggling, possibly accountability partners or um, spouses. Um, what, what, what thing can you share that, that we can learn from as well? Yeah, uh, great question. So, I, I mean, I, I think part of what I would say is, um, you know, sexual brokenness is not a barrier to someone's spiritual formation. It, it's one of the most necessary ingredients for it. Uh, and so throughout the churches, you know, we, we just have so many things in our churches around discipleship, around knowing God, around knowing one another. Uh, but we have so few language and resources to actually invite people to grapple with their own sexual lives. And so part of what I would say is uh, don't make this a basement issue in your life. Don't make it, you know, if you're a man struggling with this, because what do we know? Well, 30% of pornography users are now women. And so if you're just talking about this being a man's issue, you're alienating 30% of women that are actually struggling with this as well. And when you don't talk about that, you actually increase shame, which is going to increase their involvement. Uh, and so I think just the encouragement of you all are in the, on the front lines and to be able to really invite people to see, uh, again, just that notion that our sexual brokenness is actually a roadmap to healing, not a life sentence to sexual shame. Uh, and so I think the more that we can change the conversation to invite people to see, uh, you know, the, the heartache in my life, the difficulties in my life, the antagonists that I face, actually have so much to teach me if I'm willing to pay attention. So uh, I would just say, don't, don't make this a basement issue, create a small group around it. Because uh, what I find, especially with people, I, I'm 37, people younger than me are deeply curious about their life. Uh, and so I think the more that we can change the conversation, and get people to be really curious about the struggles that they face, the more that we'll, we'll be able to equip those that we serve. I also really like your emphasis on community um, near the end of your book. And you have a quote from Richard Rohr uh, that says, um, he argues that the most damaging aspect of someone's life is not his or her fail failure, but being disconnected from others. Um, and I'm also thinking of a trauma, trauma-informed therapists who talk about experiencing different levels of trauma in isolation and how damaging that can be. Um, and so what things can we do as a church? How do we, how do we talk about this? Can we, can we preach about it? Can we um, create small groups? Uh, how can we think creatively as the church as well? Yes, please be preaching about this. Uh, please be talking about this. I mean, so if we, you know, most of the statistics that are out there would say that one in uh, three women have past histories of sexual abuse. For men, that's about one out of every six. Uh, but that's just the paper and pencil tests that are basically asking people to self-report. 
And most of us know that when we are asked to self-report about anything shameful, whether that was something that we've done or something done to us, we're going to under-report. And so when you begin to ask women about particular stories, what you'll find is it, it, the statistics go down to about one out of every two women, one out of every three men. Uh, and so just that, that question of if, if there was something uh, that 50% of the women in your congregation were struggling with or had past histories of assault, uh, or 60% of men are watching porn in your churches and you weren't addressing that, well, you're missing a very, very significant place for spiritual formation and for the gospel to actually become real to people. So I think we have to be really honest that sexual brokenness and uh, whether that's compulsive sexual behavior or just the effects of traumatic sexual experiences are so a part of our churches. Uh, and so when you begin to think through, well, if you're going to talk about, uh, you know, 2 Samuel 13, the, the rape of Tamar, well, when you begin to unpack that, you begin to see that this is actually something that happens in a family system. This is cover up. Uh, this is a very powerful male using his power to cover up the story. And so as you preach, uh, are you inviting people to grapple with family systems and the reality of sexual assault? Uh, also, we look at, you know, Matthew 5, that intersection of lust and anger. Sexual brokenness and porn isn't just about lust. There's also a type of anger in it as well. And so if we are only discipling men to see their sexual brokenness as an issue of lust, well, what are they going to say? Well, I was sad. I was really rejected. I felt lonely but they don't actually see the violence in using their sexual life to basically ask another person in their sexual fantasy or in reality to be subservient to them for their own sexual gain. And so if the church is not on the front lines of addressing gender-based violence, uh, we're colluding with it at some level. And so I think that's the invitation of we need to equip people to see their brokenness, to feel compassion, to feel sorrow for it. Uh, but we also need them to be able to have a lot more integrity than they have ever had. So I, I did my master's in counseling. Uh, they told us, if you ever sleep with a patient, you will lose your license forever. Uh, this is not an affair that you're having with your client. This is an abuse of your own power as a therapist. I never heard that message in seminary or in any post-theological training. Uh, I was always told, you know, watch out for the seductress, watch out for the Jezebel, but it, it was never a sense of asking me to contend with my own power. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that we can be doing at the seminary level of being able to invite men and women to understand the sexual story that they're bringing into ministry to be able to, you know, in the mental health field, I have continuing education units that I have to keep going through in order to keep my licensure. Uh, pastors are some of the only professionals in the helping profession world that don't have to have continuing ed. Uh, so I think we as, as leaders have to get healthy if we're going to expect uh, our churches to get healthy. So just that notion of a leader, you cannot take anyone further than you have been yourself. And so if you're ashamed of your own sexual past or your own sexual compulsivity, you're not going to do terribly good work with inviting people in your congregation to attend to their harm. So I'd say one, just get healthy, uh, attend to those wounds, those brokenness. And then the, the second would just be Yes, uh, let's, let's, as I said earlier, this isn't a basement issue. Uh, one example of this was I was talking with a, a pastor who is a church in the Midwest, and she said, Jay, part of what we've learned is that a lot of people will stay at our church for around three years. Uh, and so she said, if people are going to stay for three years, what are the major themes that we want them to be discipled in? over those three years. And she said, definitely knowing God, the attributes of God, healthy relationships, what the gospel is all about in, in terms of theological foundations. But if our sexual life is such a huge component of who we are, uh, we're, we're never not sexual, how are we not inviting men and women in our, in our churches to contend with their sexual story? And so 
uh, again, whether it's Unwanted or Rethinking Sexuality by Julie Slattery, uh, let's bring uh, resources into the church to help them not feel ashamed and give them language to begin to talk about difficulties that, that they're facing. So long answer, but we can do a whole lot more than what we are currently doing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have quite a few questions coming in through the chat and uh, we appreciate those. We'll start moving into those. I think Becky will moderate um, that discussion. But I also wanted to say that we've been developing an abuse of power training and um, and a lot of what you've uh, mentioned, you know, is has has a place in it. We actually quoted you and gave a little, you know, shout out to unwanted in the training. And uh, for those of you who are pastors or other ministry leaders, um, we are inviting feedback for that abuse of power training. And so, um, message or email us if you may be interested in that. And um, yeah, we'd love this to be, you know, on point so that we we can have some real honest conversations about abuse of power. And like you mentioned, you know, that, that level of abuse of power between a clinician and a client um, is also that same kind of abuse of power is inherent within the position of uh, a reverend or a minister, a pastor, staff leader, and uh, parishioners and uh, youth group leader. And this, and this continues to happen. And so we, we need more conversations and, and trainings on this. Um, yeah. And uh, I did see a quick question. Is this being recorded? This is being recorded and it'll be available as a resource in the future. Um, but otherwise I'll turn it over to Becky to moderate some questions. Hey, thank you very much. So this is great. I've had a few questions that have popped up um, and one of them I'm going to bring up it because actually <laughs> it was one of the ones that was in the back of my mind, Jay, as you were talking. Um, so I'm just going to read uh, a question. Uh, it's someone who's saying I'm a campus minister on a university campus and daily see the effects of young adults of shame-based parenting around sexuality and bodies. Um, and similar to me, she has uh, two children and just um, wants to look at, um, they do a lot of talking about sex, bodies, abuse, pornography with children, and just wants to know if there's any resources, best practices um, that, we can that we can adapt as, as parents, as leaders within our churches and, our, and in our ministries. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd just turned over to you to answer that one. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and just one that we need to be so concerned with as leaders of being able to say, we can't just critique and tear down. We, we also have to build up resources. So uh, one, one adage that I heard uh, years ago was don't have one 100 minute conversation with your kids about sex, uh, have 100 one minute conversations with them. So do they know that their penis is called a penis and a vulva? And do they, do they know these things? And uh, you know, you want to be able to model for your kids that it's not something that we just talk about all the time, but there's a, there's a way of being able to honor our bodies. Uh, and so I, I, I might have to send you all some resource links. Uh, a lot of the ones that I look at um, tend to not necessarily be Christian resources. So, uh, but they're, they're there's a woman out of Seattle, it's, it's something birds and the bees. Uh, and so one of the things that she's really committed to is, you know, I, I want to present all the data that parents need to know in order to equip their kids. And, you know, you'll have to vet it for your own kind of theological uh, agreement or not. But I think that's the, there's a book, I, I think that she links called That's So Amazing that I've had some friends go through as well. And that equips, you know, just you can give a book to your kids to be able to say, this is what your body is doing. And isn't it so amazing the way that you were made? Uh, and so I think that there, there, yeah, there's a lot of resources out there to begin to invite kids to pay attention to their bodies, to know what sex is. So, um, so there are a lot of resources. I wish I had a list right in front of me to be able to point you towards, but I can look into that after this call. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I think we would really appreciate that. And then another thing just to know is that we always link um, on the network, just the recording of this. So any sort of resources like that will also be added to that information as well. So you can look back and, and receive that. So that's great. Jay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I have one other question I'm just going to read verbatim. <laughs> um, is there a component of abstinence versus harm reduction in sexuality like there is in substance addiction? 
Uh, clearly abstinence is not the answer, but is there a research about harm reduction as it pertains to sexual harm and use? Uh, I think I would need more specifics around what the sexual harm, it, like what, it, what are they referring to? I'm uh, just but, curious, but, Je Jesse, do you want me to hand it over to you? <laughs> um, I guess just, just uh, wondering about the comparison maybe between what harm reduction would look like in, in that sexual um, sexual brokenness model, um, like if if harm reduction is if there's a measured use for the addictions world, but is like I don't know if that would play out the same way in in something like porn use or um, just thinking about how someone would walk that road of harm reduction and if that has to be done with a therapist or in a small group or does that make sense? Uh, can you define harm reduction in terms of how you understand it? Uh, so I understand harm reduction in addictions as um, a measured use uh, in order to be functional and not, not to okay. be stuck in, in trauma. Yeah. Yeah. So the, some of the research would say that about uh, 60 to 90 days of sexual abstinence has the ability to rewire uh, the brain. Uh, and so some, uh, you know, this, this is more of the certified sex addiction world will actually advocate for a type of, of abstinence in order to reduce someone's compulsivity. Um, and the reason for that is that the, there's this phrase in psychology that says that the, the neurons that wire together fire together. Uh, and so just that sense of if every single time that I feel angry as a man, I go to porn, well, that's like taking an exit ramp every single time. So if I can take 60 to 90 days, that actually begins to rewire something of my brain. Uh, but I think far more the language that I use with a lot of my clients is this language of what does it mean for you to outgrow your use of pornography or sexual brokenness instead of just trying to quit something or suppress something all the time? How do I get a sense of, you know, why do I keep going back to the sexual fantasy every single time since I was 15? Why is it that in order to orgasm, I have to go into a place of violence against myself or against someone else? And so I think as we begin to really invite people to get a sense of what is the nature of their sexual brokenness, what are, what are the symbols, what are the, the meanings embedded within the sexual behavior, that will really help them understand what the sexual brokenness symbolizes and then how to outgrow it. So I'm not opposed to abstinence, but I don't think that abstinence and saying no is an adequate paradigm for recovery. I think that's, you know, that's what we've tried to do in the church is just, you know, just say no. And then once you get married, uh, things are going to go more or less okay. And yet, you know, the honeymoon is, uh, fertile territory for a lot of shame and assault these days because we haven't actually equipped people to understand their sexual life. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more. Oh, sorry, Eric, did you want oh, to pop in? Well, if you have another question, I was just going to... Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so Jay, la last week you wrote... Um, an article, which also made its round uh, elsewhere. And uh, the article was titled, um, Ravi Zacharias and the Sexual Binge and Purge, of, and Purge Cycle of Evangelical Men. And um, I really appreciated just the connections that you made between uh, just this Billy Graham rule, gender discrimination, uh, in different levels in which men and women don't work well together. And so, um, and if you, I, I just noted this morning that yesterday Christianity Today also released kind of a bombshell report about new allegations um, against Ravi Zacharias, which we always lament. And, and we just realized that these things are not uncommon. They, these continue to come up again and again. And so um, I wonder if you could just share a little bit more. And obviously you can, people can uh, read that article if, if you'd like, but um, I, I appreciated what you said there. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Yeah, it's, 
it's a it's a devastating reality and one that you know I I deeply grieve and I think that's part of the question that we have to face at this uh, in this day and age is how do we reconcile a uh, really beautiful work on behalf of the gospel that so many Christian leaders do, but also begin to recognize and be honest about the sexual sin uh, that so many of them are dealing with. And I think that's where I always go back to scripture of, you know, we, when you look at the life of Abram, uh, we know that Abraham left everything that he was commanded to, invited to leave. Uh, but we also know that he trafficked his wife. We also know that he agreed to a teenage concubine. And so scripture holds this unbelievable tension between we can honor our leaders, but if we cannot actually be honest about their shortcomings, we haven't actually understood the role of honor. And so I think as we begin to see a lot of these, just the debris uh, in the evangelical world and Christian world in general, uh, I think that we have to grapple with some of these themes and, you know, the, the binge purge cycle, I think is a, is a huge component of that. So a sexual binge is basically, uh, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling alone, I'm feeling stressed. And then I begin to binge on porn, begin to binge on a sexual acting out behavior. And then I, I catch myself and I realize, you know, uh, that is not honoring God. It's not honoring my spouse. And so then I begin to try and purge that out through my preaching, through my avoidance of preaching, uh, through trying to understand something of the goodness of the gospel for me. Uh, but if your understanding of the gospel actually isn't going into those broken, difficult places in your life and asking you to engage those things, uh, that that's when it's all part of the binge purge cycle. So we see that in an eating disorder where I consume a lot of food and then I try and exercise it out. And I see that pattern a lot with evangelical men in their sex life is that they're binging very often on porn, some other unwanted sexual behavior, and then they're recommitting their life to being faithful to the gospel, recommit to their, their um, spouse, to their ministry. And it's just this really agonizing struggle for so many people that I see so many leaders caught up in. Uh, but then what ends up happening is that I don't trust myself with women. And so what do I do? Well, now I need in my public life to purge women out of leadership. I need to purge them away so that I don't get close to them because I can't deal with my own uh, sexual arousal and my own baggage here. And so what ends up happening is it's just so much safer if I just exclude myself, set up rules, boundaries, so that I don't continue to purge. And again, not trying to say that there's not wisdom uh, in not going on a trip with you know, a female coworker and those sorts of things. But I think we have to get a sense of if you're not really honoring women, because you're binging on pornography, well, where is the purge playing out and you dealing with your own, you know, the violence against your own sexuality, but then trying to protect yourself from the world of women? Well, that has a very intentional block then on women developing leadership roles in our churches. Uh, so uh, it, it's a devastating cycle that I think just when I look at the debris of shame in men's lives, but then also the way that that blocks uh, women from taking more leadership responsibilities and roles in our churches, uh, it's just devastating. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jay. We just want to really thank you again for coming and sharing with us. I appreciate so much how open you can be about these issues that are often so hard to talk about. And um, let me just close us in prayer really quickly here. Lord, we come to you as, as broken people, all of us in different ways. And we come to you with hope, knowing that you are a God who is able to forgive, that you are a God who is able to heal, and that your transforming love is powerful in our midst. So Lord, we pray that your church would become a place where we are able to see your um, powerful love um, on display, Lord, as we learn to face these issues within ourselves and as we learn to extend grace to one another, as we embrace our whole self that you have created, broken as it is. So Lord, be with us and go with us now. Thank you for all the people that have come today and for your presence with us here. 
It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I want to say one more thing before we go. Um, next week, or next month, <laughs> it's almost October already, but October 28th, Diane Langberg will be joining us for our next webinar. She is a psychologist as well, also an international speaker that works with trauma survivors, caregivers, and clergy around the world. She's written several books, but her newest one coming out in October is called Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church. And she's going to be talking with us next time about her new book. So we're very excited about that. So join us on October 28th. And thank you all for coming again. Thank you. Bye. Farewell. Thanks, Jay. Thank you for having me.